My name's William McNeil. I'm the zone archaeologist here on the 11 Point Poplar Bluff Ranger Districts. I am uh, an archaeologist. I basically take care of all the historic and prehistoric uh, cultural resources here on the two districts. And uh, this is one of our more uh, important resources that we have here. Um, I started here in May and we actually required the property, including the mill, in the same month that I showed up. So this was a uh, quite a, a treasure to come into for a new job. The mill is very, very significant in a lot of aspects. One being it's still standing at 130 years old. This particular building was constructed in 1883, finished in 1899. So it took six years to complete. And what's really uh, very, very unique about this particular mill is the way it drives. This particular mill is unlike most others in the Ozark are in the eastern United States. The mill is actually located on a ridge top, 250 feet above the water source that powers the mill. Uh, the mill actually got its power driven to it by a series of cables running from a turbine actually located in the Greer Spring Branch. The Greer Spring Branch, located 250 feet below the mill, um, the cable system ran through a series of three towers over a course of just over 1,200 feet. So you're looking at over a quarter mile worth of cable just one way. Now uh, these towers, about 25 feet tall, each drive wheel on each tower is about 8 feet in diameter. All of it is constructed out of wood, hardly using any uh, metal babbits or uh, bearings in the structures. Uh, it was all remote, which is very, very unique even for the day. Uh, the miller could actually operate the inlet and outlet and the flow of the, uh, the mill either to power down or power up the mill, all remotely. So nobody actually had to be at the dam to actually control the inlet for the, uh, the mill dam. So what's really, really helped uh, having the mill up here is having for its customers. Uh, there were two prior mills before this one built by the same man, uh, Captain Greer. Uh, the first two mills, the first one was built in 1860, uh, just before the Civil War. And uh, during the war, the first mill was actually burned down by uh, bushwhackers. After the war, Captain Greer came back and knew that uh, this part of the world needed uh, to have a grist mill. And it was a good economic venture before the war, and he continued on and reconstructed the second mill in 1870. Uh, at the time, the mill was actually located in the deep valley where the Greer branch is and it makes it very, very difficult for farmers to bring the product in to have it milled at his mill. And uh, for Captain Greer to kind of help ease the pain for these local area farmers, he actually located the mill up on the ridge and that's kind of what makes it very unique. Um, also, the mill, um, particularly this one, it's very, very interesting. Uh, walking into the mill, all the uh, structural foundations or uh, hand hewn and all the secondary uh, support features in the building are all solid lumber and that's probably why the building is still so uh, structurally sound even 130 years after the fact. Um, let's see what else. The, the mill is actually is located or listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this mill, let's see, Qualifies under several criteria under that um, for engineering design uh, association. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, the, the Greer family, uh, like I say, they originally settled here in the early 1860s, 5960. Uh, Captain Greer, while he was constructing the dam for this particular meal, actually lost his son. So he's actually one of two people that have actually died while uh, falling into the Greer Spring Branch. So he has a little bit of a, a family history tied here. Uh, the original house place is located just to the south of this mill. Uh, there's a small family cemetery with uh, his kinfolk buried there. I'm not sure if uh, Captain Greer is actually buried there himself, but uh, all of this is located within the uh, proximity of this particular mill. Um, Captain Greer also in uh, helping his uh, his clients 
also had a residence here so his customers come could come here drop off the product stay a day or two while their product their grain or their corn was actually being ground so he had uh, conveniences built in built in for the meal itself um, now the actual milling process the first two meals were probably the um, the old-fashioned uh, Burstone uh, grist mills. This one here is a uh, newer type uh, roller mill setup, very similar to Alley and several other later mills built in the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Uh, this mill, uh, typically for grinding wheat, they had three banks of rollers. It would be placed on the first floor here. The second story would actually contain the silk screens for screening out impurities as they run through each successfully smaller and smaller grain uh, roller and then also off to the side it would have a, a roller just for corn and corn is a much softer grain than wheat and that's why the grain requires three processings to get it down to uh, workable material for bread and such corn as I say is a very smaller uh, softer grain and it can be processed one time so it's, it's a much quicker uh, product to produce the, uh, think of anything else. Uh, let's see. The mill, uh, the mill, this particular mill operated from 1899 to roughly the early 1920s. So we had a, probably about a 30, 40 years of uh, continual operation. The last two decades, uh, Greer sold out to his, uh, cohort, uh, Mr. Main Prize, and then went through successful owners until Mr. Denny bought it up in 22, I think. And so about that time, uh, the Industrial Revolution had picked up and then uh, the, the, the need and desire to have all these local meals kind of waned, where you could actually buy products at the local general store. So it decreased the, the need for having self-sustaining farmers come to the meal. And that's kind of why this one has died out and many others here in the Ozarks. Uh, and also with the uh, turn of the 20th century, you had consumerism and things like that, that that also played into it, where you could get cheaper canned goods, processed goods from outside instead of the local miller being able to take care of it. Um, Were other things produced here? Uh, Did this they particular lumber meal, I uh, well, think, was strictly corn and uh, corn and grain. Uh, I think there was a sawmill located nearby, but I'm not real sure if it was actually attached to this particular mill. I know there was a sorghum processing plant closer to Brown's Crossing just at the below the hill. Uh, I don't think there was a distillery here. I read that, that over at Markham Springs there was a uh, distillery there that uh, was operated at that mill. Um, another interesting fact, this particular mill is only one of two still standing in Oregon County. Uh, the other is Falling Springs Mill, which is located to the north and east of here. And it's a much different mill compared to this one. This is almost a, uh, a mixture of a custom mill and an industrial size mill, whereas Falling Springs is a much smaller um, customized mill usually for uh, performing small operations around the farm. And actually the uh, Browns that lived and operated Falling Springs Mill actually brought their produce here to this mill to have it ground because the, the, the machine was a lot better and a lot quicker and got a better product. So it was much further, but he got a better product. So Captain Greer, while he did operate the mill, had a pretty good booming business. And what's really interesting, uh, the mill here was actually way more capable than the uh, community had products. So this mill here could grind way more products than what could be supplied by the surrounding area, which is very, very interesting because, as I say, uh, technology started coming in in the 1920s, 1930s, kind of alleviated that. So he kind of caught the tail end of that uh, golden era of grist mills in the uh, Ozarks. So. It's quite a quite an honor to have this here in, in ownership of the Forest Service so we can preserve it for future generations.
My name's Tim Bond. I'm the district ranger on the 11 point ranger district which is part of the Mark Twain National Forest in southern Missouri. Um, I wanted to talk about the Greer Mill uh, project and uh, the Forest Service recently acquired uh, the property associated with where the Greer Mill is, is at. It was a 110 acre uh, in holding that was uh, left over from a land purchase which started in 1999 through the Greer Special Management Acquisition and Protection Act. We acquired uh, the last 110 acres uh, this last year and took ownership in May of 2013. Uh, prior to taking the, the final ownership of the property, uh, the Forest Service met with interested parties which uh, had a, hist a historical tie to the mill itself, as well as the, the long-term view of its protection and restoration. And from that, the Forest Service learned that there was high values uh, associated with the mill site of uh, achieving three things, three goals. Interested public uh, came up with three goals for the Greer Mill site, and that was to protect it, uh, work on a restoration plan and, and stabilize the mill, and the third, to interpret the history uh, of the mill in the, in the area around Greer. Uh, part of the uh, activities that happened after those meetings was the establishment of a, a partner associated with the, the Forest Service is the Friends of the Eleven Point, which is a, a private group that was established, which is a, a nonprofit. Because the Forest Service doesn't have uh, the resources to restore the mill on its own, uh, this group, Friends of the Eleven Point, will partner with the Forest Service to help us uh, do that. Probably the, one of the more important facts about the mill itself is that it is listed on the Register of Historic Places. It was listed in 2006, which means that it has national significance related to its history. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the Forest Service is so interested in, in restoring uh, the areas is because it does provide historical significance for, for America. Uh, lastly, uh, I do think that this is a great project with great partners that has the potential, if we're successful in restoring it and protecting it, that it will uh, provide a legacy for future generations and also provide what we call historic uh, economy for the, for the local area. There's a lot of people that are interested in, in history, and uh, we hope to be able to provide that uh, long term. Okay, my name is Betty Wisterman Reddy, and uh, my grandfather owned a store at the bottom of the hill, and uh, he owned part of the Greer Spring. And he, uh, years later, he uh, 
sold or didn't sell, he traded half of the spring for a field that Mr. Denning owned. And um, I would come down to the store and visit and that. And I have a cousin that lives over here close now. And my aunt lives right across the uh, road there, Norma. And that's, that's basically my connection to the, to the mill building. What's your first memory of the mill? Oh, when I was a little girl. I, it was here then, <laughs> way before me. <laughs> Why do you think we should preserve this building? I think it should be uh, preserved for our children and our children's children so that they can see our history. I'm Susie Huffstedler Van Camp, and I was born and raised at Riverton. We had the canoe rental and hauled canoes up here all the time, and we would always look at the building when we'd go by, and lots of people made lots of comments about it, and uh, it was off limits, and I would love to see it restored, so Maybe we could get a little closer to it. <laughs> it's just a part of history that we need to keep. My name's Carl Williams. I was 